Sure, Tim, uh, the, the Green Committee uh, has been responsible for, um, they do a tremendous amount of work, and especially behind Laura, uh, pushing the committee forward from uh, carbon reduction, energy efficiency. You know, we've done all the low hanging fruit stuff uh, from upgrading our lighting. You know, our street lighting was just put to LED. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have an electric uh, hybrid police cruiser now, and we're moving toward um, a more substantial fleet. So of using uh, efficient vehicles. Uh, variable speed drives in the uh, water and sewer plants. So, you know, a lot of the low hanging fruit we've hit and got those things done to get us as one of those uh, communities that is definitely a climate leader as far as being out in front and uh, taking full advantage of the Green Communities Act. Um, and I, I credit Laura for pushing because I know I get distracted from the million topics I have and Laura's there to poke me and say, hey, <laughs> we need this. So, yeah. Oh, and we have Pat here. <laughs> oh, good. Very good. So maybe, and Miles said he was going to come on. So hopefully right. he will. Um, he's uh, very, he's very busy. Hi, Pat. Hey. Yeah. Hey, we're just, we're kind of, we're kind of holding for a quorum. We can, yeah. we can approve the minutes at the next meeting. The one question I want to ask you, Mike, before I um, talk, call National Grid is we never heard about the scoping service study, right? No, I haven't heard anything about that. I, I have okay. I have a different part of National Grid coming up on the 22nd where I'm going to talk about the downtown street lights because those okay. because they were underground about having them do the LED conversion and that right. you know and, uh, and then a couple other issues with National Grid around town. But okay. just going back to Tim, the next phase that we're looking at is to become a climate leader. And that's trying to line us up to best meet the goals of the state, which is decarbonization by 2050. So, you know, we need people that are serious about wanting to uh, push forward with uh, trying to meet that goal. And that's quite an ambitious goal of complete, you know, of decarbonization and that, and, you know, that that's a goal. I know Chris will probably say it's not, it's not set in stone, but it is the goal of where we, where the state would like to be. So, okay, Chris, you're you're trying to comment, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I really shouldn't have raised my hand at the moment. Mike was speaking. Mike was speaking. Um, I, I was just curious who you're working with the National Grid uh, for that lighting and scoping study, and, and if you're not getting any response from them, um, I want to make sure that they do respond. Who, was, who was it that was our it point? Was, we were working with Sean Cruz, yeah. I think, okay. and he forwarded the request to a woman named Laura. And I can't remember. I can I can find it to you. And I've been following up as uh, as I remember, which is um, every couple of weeks. Right. And right. it's been and it's been months. And yeah, I'm I'm, I'm I'm trying to tighten up my. I have a tendency to do that too. You get busy. Um, right. But I'm trying to start when when I hear that people aren't being responded back to. I'm trying to tighten up. Um, All right. Let me just find it because I'll tell you who it is. Um, his here's was his this was in March. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. He sent it to Laura DePerna. Do you know her? No. Laura De Oh, she's at National Grid, too. Oh, so he forwarded it to Laura. So I'm not sure which vendor was chosen to do the scoping study. Please have them call contact Michael to schedule the appointment. And I think I have followed up. I think I've also sent um, emails to her. Laura DePerna. I sent. Oh, then this was 4-3. I'll be out of the office. April 3rd and 4th. Yeah, so I that was in April. So I've been trying to follow up. Yeah, it would be great if you can if you can move this along. I'm trying to we have um yeah, the last, explain it better. But. Laura, I just looked up to the last one I had was March 12th, where <clears throat> just saying that please have them contact Michael to schedule an appointment. And that's the last right. time. We've been, yeah, it's it's gotten lost, but we're trying to get, we want to look at the um, heating system in the town offices because we have very old heat pumps that are going to maybe need to be replaced, and we want to figure out the best um, best solution. It used to be geothermal, and that failed. So there's I think a lot of gun shyness about going right to geothermal, 
but we still want to kind of go through a, um, the process to figure out the um, what what our next steps could be, how to how to put us in good stead long term and short term, and what would qualify for uh, grants because it could be a, a big measure. So that's what we're looking at there. That would be great, Chris, if you can do something there. Um, and the would other forward, thing- <laughs> Would you forward me your last set of emails? Your last email? Forward to you? Yeah. Let's see. And and will you be getting back to Sean? Uh, should I wait for you to get back to him one more time before I nudge him? Chris um, is yours, Chris Vinson. I'm just sending a quick email to Miles to say we need you for a quorum. Um, either way, okay. I can, I can I can I can send something to Sean and Laura, and I'll CC you, Chris. Maybe that'll help. Yes, perfect. Yes, and I'll try to keep track of whether or not you get a response. And <laughs> right, we'll help each other. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think that's that. I think that's that's fine. I can just I can do that. But I just wanted to confirm with Mike that he hadn't heard anything yet. So I wasn't um, being, uh, uh, you know, whatever. Let, let me see. If I can, let me see if I call uh, Miles. OK, let me just do this real quickly. How are you? OK, that's good. <laughs> yeah, good. Good to see you, Pat. Good to see you, Tim. Trying to, Tim's thinking about coming on board. <laughs> yes. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're informal. He, he, yep. Yeah, he seems to be following me. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Pat. Oh yes, and he's and he was singing I'm your praises too, Pat. Yeah, I'm proud to be following in someone <laughs> in Pat's footsteps, but. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, I know in the four years I've been here, this committee's done a lot. And that if if you want to be on a committee that's been accomplishing stuff, it's been from day one, it was retrofits at the sewer water plant. Like I said, the last two years we've been doing the uh street light LED conversions. So, you know, accomplishing the goals you that know, were set out by the Green Committee. So I know there's other committees, sometimes it seems like they spin their wheels a lot and <laughs> This one has really been getting stuff done. Yeah, good, good to thanks, hear. Thanks in large part to Laura DeBester. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we're, we're a mutual admiration group because um, I'll just say this, that I count, you know, I, I, I said to Tim, I'm happy to do the kind of the work, work part, the whatever you want to call it, but I rely on everybody to, um, to guide, and so does Mike. I mean, we just rely on each other. We listen to each other, and we rely on each other, and it works out. And I and we respect each other, and we can be in the room and talk about things. So I think that's the basic, that's the essence of it. And then I can, I can, I can, I can do what you tell me to do, <laughs> <laughs> which is my approach. But your knowledge, uh, your knowledge of this whole topic is just yeah. outstanding. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's 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 uh, Chris and I grew up in the in the trenches together, actually. All right. So um, I don't think I don't I think Miles is um, got way late. He's in, he is incredibly right. busy. I want to just let's we can look at rescheduling this. There was nothing so urgent per right. se, except that I what do I do want to do, which I don't think takes a meeting, is let everyone know that. God, well, Mike, you're gonna have to the. We've applied to DO, to Green Communities, DOER, to become the, um, to get the assistance with our um, roadmap. Road roadmap. Yeah. And the roadmap would be a long-term plan for decarbonization of the town buildings, their town buildings and operations uh, by 2050. And that ap application has been received and that's pending in the meantime, we have the resolution that's going to come to town meeting on May 21st, which basically is the town's resolve to do that. And I'm going to be in Africa, hopefully, if I'm not sick and my dog is not sick, so I won't be attending. But Mike right. you'll, and Pat won't. I don't know if Pat's going to attend as a guest or not. Um, 
but Mike, you're, 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 you're comfortable just presenting that, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. So hopefully that, I don't think there'll be any problem with that. I think in decades ago, we um, had a resolution to be a, a city for climate protection. I might've been even in the eighties or nineties and that just was unanimous. I mean, it's, 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 I don't think there's anything around that that's going to be controversial, but you never know. Um, right. And then the other two things that we haven't done are we have to pass, which is what we were going to get a briefing on today, a, um, I guess it's called a bylaw. Uh, specialized code? Yeah, for the specialized code. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which would, which would commit the town to making um, all new construction electric ready. So yeah, it's, it's um, yes, I guess that's a good way of putting it. Although if you already are electric, then it makes no difference. It doesn't, doesn't change anything. So you're adopting something that won't make any difference to a lot of the houses being built. Right. But yeah. if someone wanted to put in oil or coal or natural yeah. gas, they could as long as the wiring were and done at this time of construction so that it could be converted yep. to heat pumps. Right. So it's, I, I did have an informal conversation with the building inspector and he had no, he said, yeah, that's, it makes sense. It's going to happen anyway. Let's do it. I mean, he was very, this was mad. He was very um, comfortable with that, which is good. I mean, it doesn't, it's not a, he doesn't set the policy, but um it's it's always very positive when he um, when the building inspector feels very comfortable with that direction, and then the only other thing is the commitment to look at as a, as the first look at zero emission vehicles, um, which we're already doing, or and then to procure the most uh, most efficient vehicles that meet the needs, performance standards, quality the that the town sets. So that's again a, a I think of it as as an awareness and a consciousness and a commitment, but not a. Um, but it, but when but the town has to do what makes sense for the town. So I'm I'm curious, Laura, on on the ZEV ZEV the acronyms here, zero emission vehicle uh, pol first policy. Are you guys going to bring that to town meeting or to, uh, board of selectmen? I, I think it only has to be your board of selectmen. Before what? I didn't think it had to go to town meeting. It's a no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, so yeah other town. Some other towns are, are bringing it just because their select board, you know, wants to have the town backing before they adopt it. But um, but you I guys are just. We, we would leave. The, I would leave that to my sense of the select board, and um, you know, as a policy with the, you know with the, them mm -hmm. and the department heads. I think you felt comfortable just having it as a policy, right, Mike? Yeah. Okay. I'm just keeping notes on how what town how towns are moving forward on this. So yeah, yeah. I mean, right now the impact to us is really just in our police fleet because we don't have other passenger vehicles. Everything else is fire trucks, plow trucks, and the rest, which they don't have those vehicles yet. So right, yeah, right, right. And if the town were going to consider, I mean, sometimes we very informally talk about a. A, a smaller vehicle that could just take people to, to meetings and everything meetings, else and, right. dis, and displace a bigger, more ener cons energy consuming vehicle, then that would be, that could be an EV in charge at the right. town offices. Okay, I don't wanna take up any more time. I think we do need the guidance on the, uh, I mean, I think Mike wants the guidance on the, um, uh, on the um, EV <laughs> charge pricing. Do you wanna brief us so we can be thinking about that for the next meeting or do you wanna just call it a day? Um, yeah, I just, it was just brought up that other town hall, I have just made it free for people to charge. And, you know, with four units out there, the, the cost to charge, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, we're not seeing a lot of usage. So, you know, it's one of those things, um, you know, and did, what did we they have yeah, do they have a rationale for wanting to do that, or is it just because so many are, they're all doing it? So we could. It's we, just a, basically a way of it's sort of like the same concept of keeping recycling free, even though recycling costs money now, and it used to not be, you know, 
Recycling used to get money back for your at your transfer station for plastics, paper, and everything else. And now it actually costs us to get rid of it. But as been noted, if you start charging for recycling, people stop recycling. So, you know, it's one of those things. Do you just eat that cost while trying to encourage behavior? So, yeah. Mike, have you, have you set some kind of a threshold beyond which you would want to start charging? Well, I think we'd have to take a year by, you know, if it's becoming a thing where all of a sudden it's a huge cost yeah. to charge. Yeah. Um, but I think it goes all around the, you know, as a tourist community and the rest, it's sort of, you know, it's hard for people to, I don't know, char it, it's interesting because obviously we have the medium speed ones, so people have to park here. They have to wait for a few hours before, mm -hmm couple hours before the vehicle's charged. So it's not the super fast chargers that people want to use. Um, seems to be the push, especially if you're just looking to stop on your way through or something. Yeah. So, but yeah, might be a way well, of trying to encourage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a way to, I think, support the business community. If that's what we're, if that's one rationale is that people would come here and leave their cars in the shop, then that would be it. That would be positive. If I think the only thing I want to make sure one my biggest goal is to make sure that our charging stations are on the map so people know that they can charge their star char their cars in Stockbridge. And I don't know if that's if that's still an obstacle. Yeah, I'll I'll check that. Yeah. So I know there we did figure out the so it was. We were down again with our charging stations. It's because it was a firmware update with the company that did the, we did the uh, that does the uh, charging or the cop when you swipe your uh, credit card, um, and not not swipe your credit card, but use the app online. Oh, good, it was a firm, firmware upset up, and it didn't it didn't work, and it jammed up everything. We even reset it, but then they went in and they fixed some features. They said not all it was more than just us. It happened in North Adams, it happened in Dalton, happened in a few places mm -hmm. where the firmware update sort of- Didn't work. Yeah, <laughs> jammed up things. So got it reset. We, Cheryl, our accountant went out, I had her charge her car and here and it worked. So we're back up and running. And that. Do we show up on on web? Yeah, that's, that's, what I gotta, that's what I gotta check. I'll check that today, yeah. Okay, that's great. So you check that. I'm going to call. Um, thank you for showing up, Miles. Uh, it's good to see you. Sorry, I'm late. Yep. Good to that's see you. That's okay. Do you, still have, do you still have your 10 o'clock deadline? Yeah, I, I, I'll get out of that somehow. Right. Oh, Chris, okay. go. Thank you. So let's, let's, <laughs> let's, oh, I almost, let's I almost logged off. Chris. We almost logged off. Let's, let, let's dive in with Chris. Um, Tim, as you can see, is here. We had a chance to chat. He's checking us out. And we're going to make sure he doesn't talk too much today. But um, we're we're happy. To, Tim, do you want to say anything to introduce yourself a little bit, or your interest or background? Oh, um, yeah, I, I come from the energy field, um, and uh, uh, interested in the in the in the topic. Um, uh, thank you, Miles, for uh, provide, giving uh, Laura my name. Mm -hmm. Good. Great. Okay, let's let's try to be. Um, we can we can hold on the minutes to approve uh, them unless anyone has any questions. Are the minutes okay from the February meeting? Yep. Okay. Everyone in favor of, of passing them? Aye. Aye. Everyone's screaming. Aye. Aye. Okay. Very good. So I can send those to um, to Tara Teresa to post, and then that's done. And now let's have our presentation from Chris. Can you still do that, Chris? I didn't know it was going to be a presentation, but I can. Oh um, well, it doesn't have to be a presentation. Then, no, then no, no, go just, let me let me ask. Uh, I mean, my my understanding was it was on the climate leaders program and the different requirements. And so, I know you guys are looking at the decarbonization uh, policy at town meeting yes. this spring. So, is that what you want to focus on? No, I think we did that the last time when we really looked okay. at the area. I think it's really. Anything that you can shed light that makes all of us more comfortable moving forward on the specialized code would be helpful because I think it, to pass that, I think people always just react to regulation. 
Yep. Okay. And, and new regulations. So it's trying to again see: Do we hold a public hearing? Is there going to be a special town meeting in the fall? Do we wait for next year? But really, what are what are the pros and what are the objections and how much you know that kind of thing? What is if we could get into a little bit of that? I think that would increase hopefully our comfort level with it. Okay, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go with a very concise. Uh, presentation here. Okay. Let me put up. You need screen sharing? Uh, yes, that'd be great if I, if you have it. Yeah, I just got to turn it on because we had a few incidents with screen. Oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, screen sharing is on. All right. I got to go find the right one. And I want to just tell Tim, Chris is our regional coordinator for the Department of Energy Resources. So he's our, he's our resource. Wonderful. Okay, you guys see the opt-in specialized yeah. energy code. Yes, very good. Everybody, everybody sees the slide at this point? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay, uh, so this is actually a very pared down uh, version that I gave it uh, last night at, uh, in, in Ashfield. Um, so right now, the state has, is operating under three different uh, energy codes, and these are addendums to the to the base, you know, the, the building code. Um, there's the base code. Fifty communities are still operating under that, about nine percent of the population. The stretch code, which is uh, Stockbridge's current code, and is a code for 268 communities, or so about 65 percent of the population. Um, that's that's been kind of the code for a vast majority of Massachusetts for for, for some time. Um, and all those towns had to adopt, you know, had to opt into that. And now there's a specialized code that 33 communities have opted into, uh, over a quarter of the population live in those communities. Um, the map showing that, so the light blue is the stretch code, which the vast majority of uh, communities in Massachusetts operate under. The uh, darker blue, uh, that's where the opt-in specialized code, those are the folks who have already adopted. Uh, and then, the, of course, the light off-white is the uh, folks that are still working on the base code. Um, with both the stretch code, now I wanna really focus that we are talking about looking at the difference between the stretch code, which is Stockbridge's current code and the specialized code. Uh, but both of those codes are what we call performance codes. So it's not, it, it, that, it's not based on uh, you know uh, measure you know, having identified how much fiberglass insulation you put in a wall uh, and how many panes of glass you have to have in your windows and stuff. It's not prescriptive; it's uh, performance based. And so, just to, so you understand what the HERS process, the Home Energy Rating System, this is what uh, these stretch codes rely on in Massachusetts. Um, so, uh, uh, someone building a house would contract with a HERS rater who would help them model the house, compute, do a computer modeling of the house uh, to make sure that you actually are building a house that's gonna be able to reach the, reach the uh, parameters needed for the stretch code. Um, uh, and then as you build the house, <clears throat> there are certain inspection points. So before you close up the walls, before you put the sheetrock in and you can't get back into the walls, you test the house in certain ways to make sure that it actually is going to perform the way you, the way you think it is that the insulation has been put in well, that the air sealing is done well, um, et cetera. And then when the house is all wrapped up, you give it a final test. Uh, so you, 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 know, you know what the insulation levels are and stuff. You give it a final test with what's called a blower door. So you know what kind of air is moving through the building and you give it a HERS rating. And that HERS rating goes to a third party um, a ResNet. Uh, and that third party then sends that HERS rating to the town building commissioner. So the building commissioner isn't doesn't need to be right in there, you know, verifying all this. He looks at this number that comes in the end and says, "Yep, that meets our code or it doesn't meet our code." Um, so it, gets, it reduces the kind of uh, uh, over overwork on the building inspector. So that's the HERS process. A little background: um, uh, the first stretch code went into effect in around 2008, 2009. Um, and you can see here, the gray bars are the base code, the blue is stretch code, and the green is a specialized code. 
Uh, so what's been tending to happen is that the stretch code kind of gets lowers its HERS level. I should say a lower HERS level is a tighter house. Um, uh, and a higher HERS level means a leakier uninsulated house. Uh, so as the HERS level has gone down, the base code has been following along right afterwards. Uh, right now in um, uh, 2023, or actually, uh, you know, the, where you see 2023, 2024, we're in a situation of 2023 at the moment where the stretch code, um, the specialized code is actually calling for a tighter house um, uh, right now. Uh, <clears throat> and the stretch code is not, but in July of this year, the stretch code is going to drop its surge rating as well. Uh, so mm -hmm. we'll be batched back up in that in that way. Um, yeah, the little di uh, diagram on the right hand side uh, shows hers level where it says 100, the spec home. That's like a house built in 2006, um, before you know, the stretch code was was around. Mm -hmm. If you live in like a house I live in, 1938, that's had a lot of insula insulation work done, um, it's probably a HERS level of anywhere between 100 and 140. Um, you know, these old houses, they're hard to tighten up and stuff, which is one of the reasons why we build houses this way. So you don't have to worry about that after, later on. And if you have a really tight house and you put solar on it so that you've got as much, you're producing as much energy as you're using, then your HERS rating goes down to zero. So that's what a net zero house is, or a HERS rating of zero. Okay, so with that background information, uh, here's the difference between the specialized code and the stretch code um, for uh, residential low rise buildings. Um, and this is actually residential low rise up to four units. So if you look at the top row, all electric new homes, if, you, if your house is you know, heated with heat pump, your new house is heated with heat pumps, um, you have an a, a, a electric uh, inductive, was an inductive, inductive stove, um, electric dryer, washer, electric, you know, heat pump, uh, hot water, uh, just domestic hot water. So it's all electric home. Then the specialized code doesn't make any difference. It doesn't affect you. You still operate the same way as you would have under the, uh, this, the uh, stretch code. And you can see there the HERS rating is 45 uh, for an all electric house. So you're you're not actually not even pulling it down to that 42. Um, if you do have a, you have a mixed fuel home, so if you have anything, any kind of combustion in the house, um, if it's a combustion that actually has some kind of piping or, or, or wiring going to it, such as an electric dryer, or I mean, I, I'm sorry, like a gas dryer or a gas stovetop, um, then you're required to put in the wiring when the house is built, you're required to put in the wiring alongside that uh, so that when someone wants to, in the future, replace that gas appliance with an electric appliance, they don't have to open up walls and run wiring and stuff. It, it's already pre-wired. It's the cheapest way to do it. Um, and then um, we're also asking the mixed fuel homes to uh, build to a slightly lower HERS rating, so a slightly tighter house, and requiring them to put a certain amount of uh, PV on the roof. Um, so if it's under 4,000 square feet, which I think most houses fit, although there are some places where you get a lot of houses over 4,000, but those are big houses. Um, uh, then you were asking you to put four kilowatt solar on there with some exceptions. If you have a shaded lot and you don't have any sun shining on your roof, you don't have to put solar in. Um, uh, we're not gonna ask you to put solar in a shaded area and we're not gonna ask you to cut down trees to put solar in. Um, if you if you're building to over four if your building is over four thousand square square feet and it's a mixed fuel house, uh, then the solar you put on has to be down to net zero. So basically, you have to produce as much power over the course of a year as the house is expected to use over the course of a year. And again, with the same shading um, exceptions. Um, if you're so, there, but one question, but yep, you're expected sure. you're they're expected to cite it so that it would be solar, so it could be have solar. There's no requirement for that. Um, um, yeah, I think that's, I, I think people are gonna cite the houses where they want to cite the houses. And, and I'm really hoping no one cites the house in order to avoid. So. Right. <laughs> okay, all right. I, think just, they're gonna I was cite just the, checking I think, on that. Yeah, I think they're gonna cite the houses where they where they want to be, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Home additions and alterations. Uh, again, the specialized code won't touch it. Um, there, there's requirements in the stretch code for home additions and alterations that are already in effect. The specialized code doesn't touch those. It's the same thing. Uh, historic or existing buildings. Um, there are exceptions so you don't damage the historic fabric of the building. Go over here and just um, a little bit more on the PV sizing. So if you have a mixed fuel building, that top line, I'm reading it, solar requires when there is a suitable square roof zone of 300 square feet or greater. So that gives you a little bit of context. So okay. you, if, you, if, if you don't have that 300 square feet or greater, then you're not gonna be required. Um, um, oh, and um, yeah, I'm just making sure I've got this right, yes. Yeah, so, Okay, right. All electric buildings. So with all electric buildings where, where solar is not required, this is what I was trying to remember, just solar ready roofs. So the roof has to, for all electric buildings, the roof has to be able to hold a solar array. And you have to run the chases that you can later on run electric lines through. So to make it easy to put the solar in, you need to know, it, and, and in the end, it doesn't even have to be where they run the lines, but you have to build the house in a way that you know you can run the lines um, so, you know, if you put solar in, you're going to be able to run the lines uh, through certain chases and stuff for, for the, um, so you don't have to tear your home open or run the lines on the outside of the house if you don't want to. Hey, Chris? Yeah. Hey, my name is Patrick White. I'm one of the selectmen. Um, I have a quick question for you. Um, there's a rumor flying around around here where um, there's a movement afoot to perhaps get rid of metering with electric. So in the context of solar, you'd be getting credits while the sun is out, but you would not be in effect. You'd, you'd be using, uh, you know, you'd be buying uh, uh, energy, you know, at other times of the day. Is there any truth to that? Right now, you can, you net meter. I know, so, but, but is there, are there any proposals in front of the state to get rid of net metering? Um, I think there's proposals for, it's not, I, I, I don't know, and I don't know how many are, um, uh, are serious. Okay. Um, I do believe there's a, uh, an argument out there that, you know, if you are producing as much power as you use, then you effectively, uh, you know, you no longer have to pay for electricity for supply. That makes a lot of sense. But they say for distribution and, and um, transmission, or distribution actually, uh, you're still using our wires. Uh, and so you know, there is some argument by utilities that you should really be paying us for that use, even if it's net zero, because you are using them to move electricity in and out of the house for when mm -hmm. it's being produced or when you're, you know, you're producing it during the sun, during the day, sending the electricity out and using it at night when um, the sun's not there, electricity is coming in. Um, I don't know how much legs that has. That is something that has been raised by different people. I haven't heard of anything that's a real serious threat at the moment. Okay. That's the argument that I've heard. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's that. Um, uh, how important is it to go over uh, like multifamily uh, and uh commercial? No, I don't think right now it is. Anyone else? Anyone? What's up to you guys? I mean, no, I'm, I'm good. Okay. I think we're good. I, th I when the building inspector, I asked him how many new housing starts we have here. It's like it's like three or four or five a year. Yeah. I mean, this is this. It's not a huge impact. Like it's not. There's no housing boom now. But I think that's more that you know. I think these are anyway. Go on. Keep going. Okay. So just really to put it in a uh, you know. Uh, it's 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 very similar situation to multifamily and commercial. Um, uh, with one more difference is that you narrow the pathway that you can use. So instead of using a Hertz forty five or this thing called Teddy, uh, thermal energy demand intensity uh, measurement um, for multifamily or commercial or passive house, you're you're, you're narrowed down to passive house. And if I did have a full display here, I would be talking about. I'll, I would be showing you displays on, on passive house being used for um, low income. Um, uh, they, they love it. Habitat for Humanity and stuff, they love it because you end up with very comfortable houses uh, that have, uh, between mortgage and energy use, uh, the costs are very low to operate. Um, 
So, but other than that, you see the same basic pattern here, you need to do wiring, you need to add PV under certain situations. It's kind of the same situation, but I'll, I'll go on by that. Which leads me basically to the last slide. Um, along with the uh, stretch code and specialized code um, requirements, uh, the state through the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council, which controls what MassSave does, um, is you know making sure that there are incentives out there. Uh, so, um, if, first of all, if you build an all electric home, they tend to be cheaper to build than conventional houses with uh, fossil fuel burners or boilers, because uh, you only have to put in one system. Uh, you don't have to put in uh, one AC, you know, one air conditioning system and one heating system. And then uh, MassSave has got, there are incentives for builders uh, to build all electric. Uh, um, and I think there are actually some incentives for mixed fuel if you still have heat pumps and stuff, if that that's your bit. Um, so just here's this, without going into detail on all these, uh, just kind of showing you that there are some significant benefits or incentives coming through the utilities for, for building um, these tighter houses. And then the Federal Inflation Reduction Act um, also provides benefits. So that brings down the cost more. Does that $15,000 make, okay, you might be answering the fifth, in the frequent last questions. Does that $15,000 generally cover, well, there wouldn't uh, the incremental costs for the electric wiring and the solar ready? Most likely. <laughs> okay. I mean, what's it going to cost to run an electric fire? Right. I, I don't know, but. <laughs> right, right, no. right. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. No, it seems and, like it would. I mean, I just, I upgraded my electric and it was expensive, but it, I don't, it wasn't 15 grand. Yeah. If you have to upgrade the panels and stuff, the you know, electric service, that's when it gets expensive. Um, right. You know. It seems like to just do it when you're starting, that's, that should more than cover it. Right, and that's, that's the idea between the specialized code requirements so that you you know design the house and the electric system and run the wires so that you don't have to incur that cost of trying to retrofit that right. in later on. Yeah. Right, very good. I think that makes a lot of sense. Hey, Laura, can you share the slides with me when you get them or Chris? Yeah, uh... Chris, Chris, can, Chris can send them to me. Yeah, for sure. Sure, because I gotta go to another meeting. Thank you. Okay, I, you've basically I, seen all the slides I, anyhow. <laughs> Okay, okay. But you can send us to those, or you can, yeah. All right, so here's the frequently asked questions. Here we go to the next, please. Here's some uh, resources that I can pass on. Um, but why don't we go to questions? That's it. That's basically, that's just, great. The specialized code is not that big of a lift compared to, you know, um, some changes that have happened to the stretch code. Um, yeah. Yeah, Chris, this is Miles. Um, when COVID came about and people needed to ventilate their homes, um, I was talking to several architects and engineers and contractors just in the course of business. And they're saying, yeah, homes are built so tight now and there's very little air exchange, um, a lot natural ventilation allowed. Um, it's probably not good for a COVID situation. Has there been any discussion on that at the at the state level, or do you know if that's being considered in the codes? So it, when the stretch code first came in uh, in place, and they were the HERS ratings weren't really low yet, uh, the requirement was to have uh, some kind of mechanical ventilation. And generally, it was a bathroom fan, and they would often put in these really quiet, very high efficiency bathroom fans that would just come on a certain number of times, and you know make make sure the air moves through the house. The latest stretch code, I'm not sure exactly when it came in place, but certainly the stretch code that you're living in right now, you're working with right now, requires an energy recovery ventilation. So that's a, that's a, that's a case where you are not um, um, <clears throat> just trying to you know, push air out one place and, and relying on it to leak through the house someplace else, right. which is basically what homeowners do right now. Before the purge rating and stuff, that's what homeowners relied on was just air kind of naturally moving through a building, um, which meant you didn't know where that air was coming in. It was coming in, you know, in cra cracks and crevices and um, places where uh, humidity, if there's humidity out there, you might get condensation, which then could build mold and then you bring in more air through that area. Right, that's right. kind of, that's what people have lived with for, for centuries. Um, uh, the stretch code now at, at requires an energy recovery ventilation so that you are 
actively moving air in and out of the house. Um, and you're taking the heat out of the air being discharged and you're moving it into the air being brought in so that you can you know, keep up this kind of active ventilation. You can think of it as instead of just kind of having a, a stream running through your house for your water, you, you, you pipe it in. Um, well, now, instead of just letting the air just kind of come through how it wants to, we are managing how air comes in and out of the building now. Mm -hmm. That's part of the stretch code. So the that's specialized... what the builders are doing now. Yeah, that's already there. That's not part of the specialized code. That's, okay. that's part of the stretch code. Okay, good. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? I didn't know that. I didn't know that we were, that builders were doing that. That's great. And that can be con and that can be controlled. So if you want more ventilation, you can adjust it or not. Yeah, I assume so. But I, I have always assumed that the builder is building that and the control system for that for the amount of ventilation the house needs. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So my question to the group is: Is do you think this is a um, well, we can sit with this. We can we can um, think about it. But I think what we want to figure out is. Well, I think you. These are the frequently asked questions. Chris and the other towns have they had a public hearing about this? And do you have the kind of how that's gone? Have you attended, or what would be the structure and process for that? Or does it just go to town meeting? A year. Uh, I don't. I guess we would look at Mike if there were any up to upcoming um, special town meetings being scheduled. Do we just add it on, or are there recommendations from the other towns? And how did that go? So I've given presentations on the specialized code to you know town committees. Uh, yes. For the most part, I'm trying to remember. So last night I, I presented at Ashfield, and that was a town forum, <clears throat> very specifically on the climate leaders program, and included the specialized code. And they sure. have they will have it on their May uh, town meeting. Um, it did generate a lot of conversation. Uh, the whole thing. I mean, it was everything. It was it wasn't just right. the specialized code. But there was certainly a lot of conversation around the specialized code. And um, very nicely, I, I had someone from ESD. They're um, a group that the state has hired. Uh, they're they're ex-herd raiders who are now code officials. They do code training. Uh, and we often have them join us when we give presentations. And if you have a town forum or something like that, we can I, I could come out there with someone from that firm and we could give a presentation on this um, to your general public. We did last night, and because of very poor speaker systems, uh, Mike, who was dialing in by Zoom, uh, it was very difficult to communicate with him. So I was answering the questions, and he was looking up the answers online and feeding them into the chat uh, with a bunch of resources. Uh, and that is right now being turned into Q, a Q and A um, document, um, which okay. I will get, and I will be happy to share with you guys. Um, yeah. And as far as the responses, um, you know, you there tends to be uh, some people who just don't like the whole idea. Uh, you know, they'll say they're you, you know you're forcing us to do stuff. At the same time that they live under the base code, you know, you're going to live under a building code. You, you know, <laughs> that's basically yeah. what a building code does. Right. Um, um, uh, yeah. Anyhow, I, I won't say anything more. There, there, there are some people who don't like it. Um, but I think there's often cases where you then bring it to town meeting and it still passes. Right. With, with okay. high, high numbers. So. Okay. I think you, I think maybe stop sharing because you can send oh, yes. it, you'll, you'll send us the thing. And I think we should, um, I want to poll the group a little bit on your, um, I don't see Mike, but uh, Miles and Pat, do you think of, or actually, I, would, I guess I would probably defer to Mike on this, whether he thinks we should have a public hearing or the town forum, is the town forum sort of a, a proxy for a public hearing instead of a public hearing? So you don't have to call it a public hearing and don't have to have a quorum and don't have to do this and do that. Yeah, that I think, I mean, that's why it's always been with the stretch code. Uh, there was some requirement for some kind of public meeting on it. Okay. Uh, and Just I think, yeah, and I think people basically had things like forums or they would even present it to a board of selectmen uh, meeting and advertise it 
uh, and and then that counted as a public meeting as well. Uh, okay. So that's what they've done in the past. Okay, I think we could probably do e either of those. I would probably any Miles, any comments or Pat on what we or Tim on what you think would be a better process to, or how you're feeling about. Do you have any? <laughs> what are, What are you thinking? I'm thinking to go to the next step. Um, the specialized code makes sense. I think that's what the town would want to go to to meet their overall green uh, goals. Um, it doesn't sound like that big of a lift. I know. To get there either. No, just, I don't. Just treat it like we did when we went to the stretch code. Right. right. I mean, sure my, what, my what I what I sort of say is the sort of this. It's more the common sense. Hey. Do we want to be building to the minimum code or do we want to be doing a little bit more in general if we're going to be if we you know if we're concerned about the climate and the fact that our buildings hopefully are going to last 50 to 100 years it's the one thing that we can do that really thinks about the future and mm -hmm. we can do it now so i i feel really good about it but um i've just i've, I've just doubled this i'm doubling the size of my solar and i just added heat pumps so what can i say <laughs> um so, but let's ask, we'll ask Mike, and I guess, would you both feel, does everyone feel comfortable deferring to Mike on the process? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And and before you arrived, Miles, we also talked about, um, I think Mike's going to make an announcement at the select board meeting that we're looking for one, and I, well, Tim will have to decide if he's, um, I don't know. I don't want to put you on the spot, Tim, but I want to put you on the spot. What do you think? Are you or you want to think about it a little bit more? Yeah, well, uh, in, interesting discussion and 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 topic, and I'm happy to join the committee if if that uh, if that helps out. That would be great because the appointments are going to be in June. So I think what Mike will do with tonight's select board meeting, because Pat wants to stay on Miles, you're going to stay on Mike Buffoni. I mentioned before. He felt like he has he's volunteering too much and he doesn't live in Stockbridge. So he's going to continue to do the MEI. And I know we can always call on him, but not serve on the committee. I actually want to ask Mike if he thinks that, um, and I could ask Hugh Page, who's our DPW superintendent, if he would like to be the fifth person, because I know he's very interested in this. And he also believes strongly in education. And I like having another town employee you know, a town person on the committee, because I think they offer a good town perspective in addition to uh, Mike. But Mike can announce it at the select board meeting and leave it open. And then maybe Hugh can apply or someone else. But we would have a, we would have five. We could maybe I don't know if we want to expand it or not. But um, that's my thought. And um, maybe it would be better to have another another Stockbridge resident and then um, uh, and then Hugh could always join. Anyone can always join meetings. I don't know if you have any other any thoughts on that, Pat or Miles. Probably good to have backup people as needed. You know, I think I think so. It won't hurt to have more people. Yeah, um, that's my thought. Yeah, but it has. To, I think I'll ask Mike if it's a five. I mean, we don't. I don't think we want to have a, if. I don't know. I think it's a five member committee. I don't know if that means we can't have more than five members. He was saying in the beginning, it's it's either five or seven. So you have a quorum. So I'll, I'll talk to him about that. Laura. Uh, yes. My, my, uh, across the street neighbor, when I was on park street, um, well, across in caddy corner, um, Jim McNamara and Barbara Wokey, they uh -huh. just finished putting in heat pumps and solar, um and i think it would be he maybe he would be interested in joining the group um, great do you want to forward me his contact information i'm happy to reach out to him john i can i can mention that i for i can ask if he would if he would be interested at all before you know you reach out to him okay and, and do you think he would be a good fit for the group i think so yes okay and okay. uh um, if nothing else, to when there is any kind of panel or forum for the town participants, you know, residents, that mm -hmm. to have him maybe um, he would be willing to speak to his experience with those 
technologies and how it's worked out for them because i know they've been very happy so far very so, good and if you have other that sounds great pat you could do that and if and then i could talk to him um i don't know if the selectman is going to set a deadline for um applications to be received if anyone has other suggestions all of you s send them to me or let you know and then i can you know just can talk to people about it too because i think we've had a I would say a good, a very, a functional, as some people say, there are a lot of non-functional committees in Stockbridge. This has been a functional one. So we'd like to kind of continue in that, in that, in that mode. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Chris. Um, are you guys, uh, is the conversation over the stress code done? Yes. Okay. I, I, do I, have so. one, I just have one oh. last thing just to mention, it just as far as strategizing and bringing forward the town. Um, uh, at the same time the specialized code became available, the stretch code went through a bunch of changes. And um, it got, kind of, those kind of got conflated. <clears throat> so some people think that if they're yeah. asking, asking to be doing something, they're actually being asked to do something that's already been adopted by the town. They don't right. realize it. And so just being really aware of that whenever you talk to someone and be very aware that this is already in the code, this is already what the town has, and this is what you're voting on. So right. just, you know, um, we've, we've kind of learned to, in any kind of presentation, to really highlight the differences, uh, you know, and, and focus on what you're voting on, because um, uh, you can get derailed, conversations I, get derailed. I, I think that's, I think that's an exceptional point, because I was talking to someone else, and they, yeah, I think that, I think that is exactly what the reality is. And Mike isn't here, so we can't go back to the um, EV question. Mike's really saying that based on we'll, we can think about or we can do it at the next meeting that in other towns, they're not charging at all for EVs. In Stockbridge, I think it was very clear that from the select board that if we're going to have EVs, they wanted the users to pay for the EV plus a um, kind of a, a creative fund to maintain them. But I think Mike said that the other towns aren't doing it and that it doesn't really um, it's it's so minimal right now that we should maybe think about just getting it, um, making it free for now, and then monitoring it um, in a year. That was that was that's what he wanted guidance on. I don't think he feels um, strongly, but he was going to report to us what other towns were doing, and see what we thought. I think he feels like he can navigate the select board, but he would want our want want our thoughts about it. So I don't really I don't have an opinion really. I think. Um, you know, it's one of those things where some people might say, what, we're letting people charge their cars for free, why are we paying for it? And maybe we just don't want to do that and have that reaction. Or maybe want to say, we're, you know, I think you have to have another reason besides that the other towns are doing it, I guess. So, I mean, I think the only reason I can think of is that it would encourage visitors to come to Stockbridge and park their cars because we don't, and because it's, it, you know, they take longer to charge here, but I can't really... I can't really de defend that proposal. I don't know if there are the other well, thoughts. Are there just, I should know this, Laura, but if you, I don't have an EV car, but if you go to this charging station and plug it in, do you pay for the energy at all? Right now you do, I think, as long as they're working. I think there was some problem, which I hopefully, Mike isn't here to, you know, he was going to brief us on how much the use okay. is. I mean, I did, I scanned my thing and I charged my car as a test. Apparently for a while, I don't know which mobile, which phone thing didn't work on it because we were in a zone, I think it might've been T-Mobile. So that was a big glitch. And then the um, people who are operating it, I think they might've had some issues. So again, I don't know if this is a technical issue or if it's a um, philosophical issue. Again, I don't, I don't really have an opinion. So I I'd just like to make sure for me that they're working right and they're on the map. And then mm -hmm. I think we can, I don't think it's going to be, I think people, if they're used to charging the cards, know how to do the QR code, which I didn't, and try and plug it in. But um, yeah, I just went, when you said other towns don't charge, is the energy and everything is free, I guess? Everything is free. In Lenox, really? I can go to oh. Lenox, I can plug in my car and it's free. Wow. And in the other towns, he went to an administrator's meeting. And I think the other towns that are doing it, it's just free and they figure I don't know if it's the hassle factor. So maybe let's just put that on the agenda for the yep. next meeting. 
or he can, um, or I try, I usually meet with him monthly and I can try to get some information, but I can't, we can't, um, we can't talk by, we can't, whatever it's called. We yeah. can't have a discussion on, uh, because of the, um, you know, the, the laws. Yep. Okay. But, but I can try to present some information, um, about it. Anyone else have an opinion? I like it being, you know, of course, to the town employees. I mean, we had such a discussion and there was such a feeling that no people should pay and it's a perk to not have to pay anything extra and just to pay for the cost. So I was sort of surprised, but I'm, again, I'm happy to do, you know, whatever the, whatever the group says, or I think Mike would too, he would, everyone's going to defer to the group. No, yeah. no, I'm going to step off unless you, unless you need me. For okay. something else. Do you have okay. any feelings? Do you have any opinions about that? Have you listened to these conversations? Sure. Um, so when I was in Northampton, uh, we let it for, be free for, for quite a long time. And the reason in Northampton was that the most people, the people that are going to use it the most aren't the people who live there. Uh, they most likely have a home charger. Um, although there may be some cases where there are people who don't have home chargers who live in apartments or something. Um, uh, but the most most of the time, the people who are going to use it are the people who are coming into Northampton to spend money, uh, and you know we wanted to make sure people were very comfortable to be able to come into Mass uh, Northampton to spend money. So it, you could you could, you know you're going to be able to plug in and and um, and charge was a kind of a perk to make sure that happened. At a certain um, point before I left the city, I yeah, but I'm on another call. I know I'm going to talk to her at eleven thirty, correct? Okay. Bye. So at a, at a certain point in Northampton, I did look around and start inquiring, um, uh, you know, who charged, and a vast number of people, a vast number of towns were charging in the Pioneer Valley, right in the valley. Um, and so Northampton um, kind of said, okay, we should probably start charging at this point, because uh, ultimately, uh, you know, as it grows, and uh, and this was after Northampton put in a lot of chargers, and you know, and we have and we put in the infrastructure to put in a lot more. So it, and each one of those, you're paying some kind of a, um, um, a reporting charge, basically your IT charge, uh, mm -hmm. which is you know not not small for charge point, which uh, what do we use? And so it was like, okay, we'll get we'll bring some money back in for that um, to start offsetting it. In the long run, we don't know how this is going to pan out, but traditionally municipalities aren't running gas stations. So why are they the ones running the electric stations? You know, um, uh, but I don't know how it's going to pan out in the future. So it, it is kind of a call um, that where is Stockbridge in that process? Um, and um, I left Northampton and my understanding was that they started charging. They started, they implemented that. Last time I was in Northampton, I plugged in my car. Uh, it looked like it was going to charge me, and at the end, it hadn't. <laughs> okay, that's the best of both worlds. <laughs> so there's my <laughs> there's my background. So I think it's I mean I think it's a call. I think it's you know you you think it through. There's a benefit to keeping it free, particularly if you're doing it for people coming in to visit your town, and that you want to make sure that they're comfortable, um, and they're they're not going to have a problem. They're not going to have to worry about a credit card or something to get charged and um so you know so it's, it's a debate to be had is there i i i'm ignorant of this but is there a way to put in i know we were going to have people maybe put in a code if they were an um an employee of the town um is there a way for if you don't charge to at least put in maybe your zip code so that uh, you can track that? Hmm. Uh, what so kind of charges? Just as, just as an information, you yep. know, not, nothing. Right. What kind of charges? I think I have... That might be interesting. Yeah, it would be if, if that's, if it's, Pat, if you were doing the IT, we could do it that way, but you're not, we check that, that might be interesting. What kind to, of charges do you that. have? Are they charge points? I can't points? remember. I can't remember. It wasn't. It wasn't the charge point though. It's someone else. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Charge point has a really nice interface and a lot of opportunities to actually interact with people at the at the in different ways at the charger. I don't know about others. Um, they might be cheaper. Charge point 
point does tend to be expensive. It's just what everybody is doing in the Valley. So. Right. I think that we went with whoever the, um, with gar whoever guardian suggested when they mm -hmm. did that. So mm -hmm. we probably deferred to them. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll, I don't know, does anyone have a, like without, do you want to, Pat or Miles, do you have a, an opinion on charge on, or would you want to defer the conversation or? My, my initial, my initial impression is that, that I would be for, agree with the um, zero cost. Yeah, I'd like Mike to weigh in if he went to this conference and he knows what's going on with other towns um, around us, but I, I tend to lean that way too. I have no idea what the cost actually is. Is it like ten dollars that the town pays every time someone charges? No, their car? it's yeah. it's it's <laughs> it's it's probably it's you know if I charge my car at the Norman Rockwell Museum for a couple hours, it's like less than a dollar probably. Okay. I think they might have a seventy-five cent parking fee, and okay. then it's you know thirty cents a kilowatt hour, and in two hours, it's you know whether it's a slow charger, it's not that much money. I see. It's. It, yeah. It, it tends to be the more expensive charge, although I don't know about your charges. It might be different, but that- um, Where ours are level two. That digital, the digital, well, it's level two, right, but it's uh, charge point, the manufacturer, they're the ones that give you the, um, oh, what's the word I think, the monitoring, the data, the, the data package that comes with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. The data package tends to be more expensive. That's That tends to be the biggest expense to the town, quite frankly. Yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah the electric electricity is, Okay. You know, I mean, if you really are using them heavily, then I suppose, and you have a lot of them, then it will build up in cost. Um, mm -hmm. But a few chargers, I, I think Laura is right. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pen. It's okay. really penny. It's not much, right? So it might, you know, again, it might cost the town a hundred dollars for a year. I mean, it's, I think Mike might be right in this one. Let's just let let's 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 let people charge them and see what it is and bring people to town. And, um, you know, I think, I think we can, you know, I think the resistance is going to come from people. I think we, would, I think it would be good to have an estimate of what the cost is to the town so that when people say, oh, we're paying for people to charge their cars and we're not of this and we're not of that, we can say, hey, you know, like what Chris is saying, people are going to spend their money. We can monitor it. We can change it. We did that. And, you know, and it's just. This is a let's let's go with this. But I think, again, I think. Um, well, Mike can give us the what the uses experience has been to date, and we exactly. can make and some I think if he's Right, and I think, if, and from his perspective, it's been so minimally used that right. there's no reason not to just let it be. Um, Tim, do you have an opinion? Well, I'd like Pat's uh, Pat's thought about uh, collecting data. Um, and um, yeah, Chris's uh, thought uh, that uh, any uh, that most residents have charging stations if they have electric vehicles. Is, did I get that right, Chris? Yes. Yeah, most of, most of them will have some way of charging at home because, because it's less expensive than paying someone else, no matter what. And you know, you got your car plugged in overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it would be interesting to have. A, have data uh, uh, like the zip code data uh, Pat was referring to. I think that, that I'll see if we can do that. I think that in only I would say in Stockbridge's case, well, maybe it would be uh, we have our solar um, array. So I think we've actually pay a little less for electricity and the town probably has a good rate. Although if you, if you add on a 30 percent for potential maintenance, it comes up, it might come up to be what it would be at home. But people aren't going to drive to town to park their car to do whatever, you know, yeah. if you live I, here. I, I do think it's important that uh, residents, uh, if this was to move forward, uh, to, to make it free, that residents understand what the minimal cost is for, for charging. Um, because I, 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 for one, might uh, resist it if I, if I knew the, the cost was something, something more substantial. But if it, given the minimal cost, it certainly makes sense. Okay, I think that I think we can get that information from Mike, and he can, and we can let let him know. So the question is really to Mike that we just because he wasn't here for that sort of around the minimal cost and some of the data for the usage to date, and um, I think that anything else that was it, and the and the zip code. 
or other information. Okay, very good. We're not gonna set another meeting. I'm gonna talk to Mike and we'll recap this. I'll send out some notes from this meeting. Pat is going to um, talk to her neighbor, her former neighbor. And anyone should actually, if you have other thoughts on people who you think would be good um, members of this committee, that would be great. Pass them on. I can in, I can share what I, you know. I can talk to them ahead of time, and then um, or figure out some other way to you know get have a have get to know people. And I think that's it. Anything else that you guys want to bring up? Anything I forgot that was on the agenda? I just have a, a curiosity question, and that is. Um, I saw a program oh, a while back on TV about solar cars and <laughs> which would, if, if that's the way that it's, that it's eventually going to go, that would eliminate all these charging stations. So I was just wondering, is, how is that coming along and is that going to be anything that will be with us in the next 10 years or is this way out anybody know want me to take a stab at that sure i don't know i worked, I worked for the northeast stable energy association for a long time which held the american tour to soul which started off as um you know so cars with solar arrays on them uh it started in europe um solar powered cars doing a road rally we brought it over here and it became electric vehicle road rally um long before electric vehicles were around and the reason why is that you put solar on a car, it's nowhere near, uh, it nowhere near has enough energy density uh, to power the car. You're gonna go through bridges and tree lined streets and stuff like that. So it's not always gonna be in the sun. So it's not the best place to put solar because it's not always gonna be in the sun. You don't, then you're gonna wanna park your car in the sun all the time when you might not park in the shade anymore. And if you get in a fender bender, it's a very expensive um, piece to add to a car to actually get cracked. So it makes a lot more sense to put the solar where the solar is going to be best, uh, you know, is going to get its maximum use and then charge the car with the solar. So it doesn't really quite make sense to put solar on a car. It's an interesting technological feat, um, uh, but we're nowhere near it. And I don't think anybody's aiming for it. <laughs> oh, thanks for the background. I was, I was sure. just curious. Yeah, it, absolutely. It's... Absolutely. You're right. No, it's, it's, it's one of those things that feels like a natural, it feels like a natural thing. And then when you think it through, you say, oh yeah, there's actually some reasons why probably not to do it this way. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You definitely wouldn't do it if you were living where you needed to go through tunnels to get to your <laughs> destination. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> uh, dead cars in the tunnels. Oh. Okay. I'm, I'm Everyone gonna... very good. We did this. Miles, I hope you get to your next meeting. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you for guys. The, Thank it's you, all Lord. it's all so appreciated, Pat, and for making the trek trek to Stockbridge, Chris. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that I was the only and Mike and I were the only ones. <laughs> yeah, well, I think Pat walked in for a minute and then keep thinking about new potential members so that we have some good applicants, whether it be five or seven. Yes, Chris. I'm just gonna jump off. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Bye, Chris. Thank you so much. It's appreciated. You're welcome. Very welcome. Yeah. Okay. And then um, we had just, I'll talk to Mike about a process. Do you think, I think maybe, I mean, would it be easiest to have Chris do a presentation to the select board in the summer and call that a public meeting? And then if there's a, um, uh, I can talk to Mike about it. And then if there's a special town meeting, we could then put that on the agenda or if, if, it, if it has to wait the specialized stretch code till next annual town meeting, we could again do something before that. That's what I'm thinking. Does that make sense? I think Chris yeah. presenting, you know, he he assumes we all know the difference between the stretch code modifications that have taken place and the new specialty code. But there's some fine lines there that I think the Board of Selectmen may want to know about that we probably aren't equipped. Yeah. yeah. Do you think his presentation from today would be just right for the select board? I think so. I do too. Yes. I wonder if we could get, uh, we could maybe ask Matt, the building inspector, to attend that as well, just so that he would be there and. Um, yeah. He might uh, have questions or be educated. Yeah. Right, exactly. 
he's very again i think he's he knows the builders he was a builder yeah so and he's I very think, he's very open minded to ideas and totally yeah. i was yeah. so you know because we had a house i'll just tell you that didn't that the state questioned our annual report because its hers rating was too high and we couldn't figure out, you know, sort of was it the builder who screwed up? Was it Ned because it was before his time? What what happened? And as it turned out, and Matt was, you know, was talking to people and looking at it and researching it when I just happened to go walk in the office. And then Chris checked with the builder and it turned out because it wasn't in the notes that that builder had actually put solar on it. So it did meet the HERS mm -hmm. rating and it was, you know, so everyone had done their job. It just wasn't in the data. So mm -hmm. it made me feel very good about Ned and Matt and the builder and the state. Everyone's doing their job. So that was very good. Yep. Okay, Mike, you're back. Do we have, does everyone have five more minutes so we can talk, so we can summarize our conversation for Mike? Okay. Sure. Great. Mike, we talked about the charging stations and Chris weighed in as well because, and you weren't here, but I think the um, thoughts were, because Chris was saying that in Northampton, for, in the Valley now, they're all starting to charge, but it was free in Northampton. And the rationale was that people, that people who have electric vehicles will charge at home, but people who don't, who come to town will park because they're spending money in town. So that was sort of the rationale, but the real questions from the committee are sort of what, it, you know, to the, ba the, the backlash is really, um, why should we be paying for people to charge the car? Right. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and so sort of what is, how many people are charging the cars? Is there a way to track if they're- um, Yeah, I could get that information for our next meeting. Yeah, um, we're interested in the use. Yeah, and right now we're just we're just charging what it costs us. Mm -hmm. So we have no up mark. We're just charging um, the 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 kilowatt per hour rate we have, at, plus the two percent fee that's charged by the company that uh, <coughs> processes the payments. So and do we do we get a report from the company of how many people we have? Uh, we have access to a dashboard to see how many people are using it and stuff. Yeah. And how much and how much their average charges. I mean, if it turns yeah. out that over the last six months, 10 people have used it and it's been $2 a charge and it's been $20. That's one thing. If it turns out it's a hundred people and it's $10 and it's a thousand dollars, that's something else. Yeah. Let me, for the next meeting, I'll, I'll, I'll pull all that and we'll have a little more substantive discussion on it. How does that sound, everybody? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, so right now we're gonna we're gonna yeah we're gonna leave it with um, everyone's getting the same break whether you're a town employee or a volunteer or a guest everyone's paying the same amount that seems fine if it's if it's if that's what it is it's, cost plus two percent uh, yeah it, it's it's neutral right now it's not making money it's not. You know, there, I know uh, Guardian had mentioned some places ch charge like a couple extra fees. So then you put the money into a revolving fund and you use it to repair, make re small repairs, things like that. But I think right now, right now we just have it at covering cost. <laughs> right. And if anything happens, it's under warranty or we have insurance, I guess. So maybe we just kind of uh, we're 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 heading toward not being covered and what you do is you end up with people that leave the the like the part that you plug in they they in the winter they just drop it into the snow you know things like that you yeah. know people can be and then you have to replace those those aren't covered under the main parts are but the like those extra pieces are not and then at some point we'll be out of warranty anyways and then We'll have to right. cover costs. So insurance isn't going to cover those small things right. like that. And yeah. Okay. So we can, we can, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. So let's, um, I guess the consensus, let's leave things be, Mike, you're going to try to get back to us with a little bit more information. So yep. our guidance is more um, substantive or more grounded yeah. in, in, yep. in reality. <laughs> That sounds good. And then on the um, and then what we also thought was that for the opt-in stretch code, that what would really help that Chris's presentation today was just the the kind of the that 
if we could do that for the select board, maybe ask Matt to attend, maybe publicize it a little bit, that the select board might have much more of a comfort level. And that would be a good, it would be a good, um, good educational session for everybody. Right. Do you think, um, what do you Well, I think it depends on, that has to go to town meeting. No, it doesn't. So, oh yeah, that has to go to town meeting. That has to go to town meeting, the stretch, yes. Um, right. So... I think it's timing education with the board timely enough for when it's going to come up for a vote. <laughs> right. But do you think there's going to be a special town meeting between now and next year? Uh, the biggest driver will be depending on what happens with the school. Um, Cause I, you know, we're not going to do a special town meeting just over the stretch code, um, right. but you know, there is a potential of some stuff coming forward, uh, debt exclusion votes, other things. And depending on the timing, could could would you could do you could foresee that being able to incorporate this or that being just really a single? Well, no, meeting? we could we could add. You're still having a town meeting, so you can definitely add things to it. But last I heard, I don't think it's going to happen until the. I think it's going to be next next, not this fall coming up, the fall afterwards. Okay. So I think it's so, so 2025. Wise, so timing wise your guidance would be just we're informed and we should just hold on this hold on educating the select board and the public on this on the specialized stretch code until it times more closely with a town meeting vote whether it's a yeah. regular town meeting or a specialized town meeting the, we could have a by the time we go to vote depending on we have people running for state rep other things we could have a only one of the three people still here <laughs> so right. yeah yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, and technically Chuck has a Chuck's in a race right now. So the, technically we could have all three <laughs> new right. by next year. So, um, yeah, I think we just, uh, just wait on that one. I don't think the timing right now is needed. Okay. So I think the next meeting would be, um, when you have some information, we could have a brief meeting to guide the, to guide. I mean, what I think there's, well, we'll see if we get the roadmap grant, we want to have a meeting on that. Yeah. And um, Pat had another, oh, and, and Tim is, will Tim would be happy to join our group. I think if you can make an announcement at the select board meeting, do we have yeah. to have five or seven or can we have more than five? Uh, Does I think, does it have to be a, an even, an, an odd number? Well, it's easier for quorum and everything else. So whether you have four or five, you still have to have three people to have a meeting. So you might as well have five, which gives you no, no, a better no. chance of running. Yeah, I believe you were established as a five-member board. Right. So, and that's six, what it goes seven. back to. Right. We could expand the board to seven, but then your quorum becomes four. And that. So right now, I think what we should do is just get it back to a five person board, fill the two spots so that, you know, if as long as three can make it, you can hold the meeting. So, OK. And then also the last question is, and you can think about this. Um, do you think another I was thinking about Hugh as a potential other member or a, a resident, which do you which would you which would be well, your Hugh, Hugh is, uh, you know, I, I know I, I've said this before that I, I feel like okay. staff oh, staff yeah. okay. should be advisory, except okay. if the staff is a resident. Oh, Hugh, right. is a, okay. Hugh is a resident of Stockbridge, so he has every right to be on a committee to um, steer the future of Stockbridge, you know, unlike. Like I said, myself and others who, you know, don't live in town, our job is to carry out the missions of these boards. So, yeah, okay. I think you is definitely somebody that could be considered for this because right. he is both an employee and a resident. Right. Yeah. And I know he's very interested in this and he likes to do, you know, he believes in education and he has, you know, he has good, he has good perceptions. So I think we can, I think if you announce that there's going to be a vacancy, we have four members with Tim. We have one yeah. more member. Um, I can touch, touch base with Hugh and I can touch base with someone that Pat thinks might be good and we can see if someone else comes forth and we can talk right. to them and then just appoint another member, right? Yeah, and then we're coming up to a point anyways for all the boards. Right. So, Miles, you're still interested next year? And yeah, everyone else is, yeah, everyone else is, everyone else right. is on board. Pat you. and Miles and Tim and me. So we just need one more person. Right. But let's yeah. open it up and, and we'll see who that who if someone comes forward. 
Sounds good. I'll have him announce it tonight. My fingers that, that Jim McNamara would be interested, or his wife, but I think he would be more interested. Okay. But you can always reach out to people and that, but we'll exactly. also, I know the select board does want when there's openings to make announcements so the general public's aware. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys, thank you all so much. It was a sort of a, a strange meeting that was less efficient than usual because we covered everything a few times, but we covered everything a few times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>